Welcome back, everyone. We have been discussing finding fish. Earlier, we covered food and protection, and now we're into comfort. In the last video, we talked about how temperature affects fish, and now we're going to take a look at how oxygen levels in water affect fish. Remember in Unit 1, how we, we talked about the, the gills of fish. They function like our lungs. They're taking oxygen out of the water where our lungs are taking oxygen out of the air. They're both fluids, air and water, but they function a little differently. We don't have to worry about dissolved oxygen the way fish do. Since oxygen doesn't mix in with the water, although water is made up of oxygen, the oxygen has to be present as a dissolved gas. And this can make it rather difficult for fish certain times of the year, certain bodies of water, to find enough oxygen to, well, breathe. In fact, when dissolved oxygen drops below about five parts per million, a lot of fish suffer. Some species are more susceptible to low oxygen levels than other species. We talked about how the gizzard uh, shad is, is, is very oxygen sensitive. When oxygen levels are between eight and nine parts per million, most fish are very, very happy. But whenever it drops, that's where things start to, to go wrong for them. Temperature plays a very big role on how much oxygen is in the water. And if you remember back to, to your, uh, uh, your chemistry days, you studied Charles' Law. And basically it says that the colder a fluid is, the more dissolved gas that fluid can contain. Inversely, the warmer the fluid is, the less dissolved oxygen it contains. So when water temperature is 35 degrees during the middle of the winter, it can actually hold a lot of dissolved oxygen. But when that water temperature hits 80, 85, 90 degrees in the summer, it loses that ability to hold dissolved oxygen and fish start to suffer. Or fish move to areas of higher oxygen concentration. Wind plays a tremendous role on dissolved oxygen. If you're fishing in Indiana and our prevailing winds are from the east or from the west to the east, if you're fishing along the western shore of a, of a reservoir or lake and you're not doing so well, well, go east. Chances are that the waves are a little stronger on the eastern shore of that body of water, creating more oxygen. Because as the waves, you know, break and crash up onto the shore, and it doesn't, we're not talking, you know, five-foot waves here. You know, we're <laughs> talking two, three-inch waves. Just enough that the air gets entrapped within the water and that oxygen is transferred into the water. Stream inlets are also a favorite place uh, to look for fish. Typically the large bodies of water are going to heat up very, very rapidly and maintain their heat. But if you can find a little stream that is coming out of a, out of a, a, a valley, a ravine that is mostly shaded, that water is going to be cooler than the main body of the water. And so it's going to contain more oxygen and that is going to attract more fish. Remember how we talked about in, in the springtime as everything is starting to warm up, streams are carrying warm water into 
the lake, the very, very cold, very often ice-covered lake. And fish are going to congregate at the outlet, not only for the warmer water, but also that stream is bringing nutrients and, and food. So this is kind of the reverse in the middle of the summer. Let's talk a little bit about the oxycline. Uh, not the laundry detergent. Don't screw this up. The oxycline is, is like the, the thermocline. It's the, um, uh, the boundary layer between two densities of oxygen. And right here on this illustration, we can see the warm water, which has lower oxygen, is sitting on top of the colder water, which has the higher oxygen uh, concentration. The other thing to look for is plants. Just like trees take in CO2 and through photosynthesis convert that to oxygen that we breathe, plants take in the sunlight and produce oxygen except now in the water. If you find a good weed bed, that is going to be an excellent place for fish to hang out, not only for all the other reasons that we've talked about. You know, it gives you know cover to smaller fish and so on and so forth. But those plants are also producing oxygen. And in the, the, the heat of the summer, this becomes very, very important. Here's an illustration of the Chesapeake Bay. And remember that, or take notice that this is north up here. I wish they had done this with north oriented to the top of the page, but oh well. So this is the, the, the Chesapeake Bay. Uh, Norfolk would be down here. The Atlantic Ocean would be out here. And if you take a look at this, this is a, a depiction of dissolved oxygen in the Chesapeake Bay between February and July. You can see in February, <laughs> the entire bay is just rich with dissolved oxygen. Over here, it gives it in, uh, what, milligrams per liter? But during the summer, here in July, you can see this central area right here is very, very oxygen poor. And you can see the depth that this is running. So the deeper water are, has virtually no oxygen, while the surface water does have oxygen. Also take a look at the eastern shore of the Chesapeake. There's good dissolved oxygen. Which way is the wind blowing? Well, if that's north, this is east, down here would be west. So as the winds are blowing west to east, the waves are getting stacked up and piled up here on the eastern shore. The eastern shore is relatively shallow compared to the, the western shore of the Chesapeake Bay. So remember, uh, uh, vegetation, plants produce oxygen and attract fish. Okay, let's talk about weather effects. Weather greatly affects fishermen and also fish. These are general statements that I'm going to make. There's always exceptions. Stable weather produces stable fishing. And if you think about that, if we've had like eight days of really, really gorgeous weather and you caught fish on day three and day six, there's a good reasonable chance that you're going to catch fish, catch fish on day eight. Unstable weather produces unstable fishing. Yeah, as soon as that weather changes, the fish are going to change. It doesn't mean that you can't catch them. It means that day 10 is not going to be the same as day eight or day six. Uh, forage fish are going to move. 
This is what that old wise fisherman was talking about. He doesn't care where the fish are. He only cares where the bait fish are. Uh, you'll also see changes in, in water clarity, uh, particularly uh, after a, a heavy rain. Uh, temperature and oxygen levels will also change. Uh, one thing about oxygen levels and rain, yes, rain actually does increase O2 levels. So if we get a really good thunderstorm moving through uh, August, whenever the temperatures have been very high, <clears throat> it would be a really good time to go fishing right after that, that thunderstorm. Cold fronts and warm fronts. If, particularly in the spring, um, if a warm front is moving through, and again, our weather patterns move west to east uh, in, in most of the U.S., you'll see a heavier um, uh, fish activity one to two days prior to that, that uh, warm front coming through. How they do this, we don't know. Some fishermen say that fish are better weather pre uh, uh, predictors than the uh, meteorologist. Some meteorologists might actually agree with that. Um, during real periods of, of, of hot weather, uh, whenever you're sitting under you know, a ton of warm air, that cold air, a cold front moving through, is going to have the same effect. You're, you're going to see a change in, in, in uh, fish behavior and a very, very good change. Like I mentioned earlier, uh, wind has a great effect on, uh, on fish behavior. Um, not only is there greater oxygen generation uh, uh, th via wave action, but you'll also stir up invertebrates and other foods uh, source uh, along the shoreline. In, in fact, as, as waves go crashing into the shore, and we don't we're not necessarily talking about Lake Michigan here, you know, Lake Monroe, Lake Griffey. Uh, those, those waves caused by the wind are, are going to, to, to stir up the bottom. And if there's little invertebrates uh, in there, uh, you know, larva, nymphs, those are going to become up into the water column and small fish are going to come through and start munching out, of the, out on them larger fish are going to come through and start munching out on the smaller fish and all the way up the food chain you know that that 10 pound largemouth bass that you've been hunting um, is is going to be in there you know uh, uh, taking advantage of of the the waves if you're in a boat or in a fishing from shore look for the mud line and this is an area along the shore where the bottom has been stirred up so much you can see a visible separation between the water in the main body of the lake and the water right along shore. This is an excellent place for predators to patrol and just in and out of that mud line. And remember, whenever you're going fishing in questionable weather conditions, always have a backup plan. People get hurt in real foul weather when they're out fishing. So severe weather drives fish deep and smart fishermen indoors. This is the one case where you might actually have a backup plan of going bowling. Cloud cover off obviously affects um, uh, temperature. Uh, <clears throat> remember, fish don't have eyelids. They can't dilate their pupils. So fishing on a cloudy day can be really, really good because fish are going to be a little bit more active. They're not going to be seeking that heavy cover. Rains be good right up to flood stage. As water levels change, it can flush out more food into the, uh, into the water column. Be careful when the water starts to escape the banks uh, on streams and rivers. Then we get into dangerous conditions for the fishermen. 
and fish aren't all that thrilled about it either and they generally uh, will hunker down into very familiar uh, holes and just kind of wait out the, uh, the, the, the high water. A lack of water, on the other hand, it can be very, very hard on fish and very, very hard on fishermen. Uh, people who insist to ins insist on fishing uh, during the drought, uh, particularly by boat, very often suffer severe boat damage because you used to be able to uh, go between uh, this point and that point at full throttle and whenever the water is three feet lower it exposes all those stumps and rocks that you didn't even know were there and you know the next thing you have to do is to get your boat into uh, the mechanic for a lower unit uh, repair so i generally don't like to fish during real dry drought conditions um the water is just really really hot, warm and it's really hot out there i take full advantage of modern air conditioning um not that i've taken up bowling but this might be a good time to stay inside and tie some flies looking forward to the uh, to the fall fish are under a lot of stress and in the spring, you were out there catching uh, nice three-pound bass and releasing them, and they were, you know, doing a, 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 a tail wag as you threw them back into the water. Now, when you catch that three-pound bass and you put them back in the water, she just kind of lies there and it's like, oh, and she sinks down out of sight. Fish mortality is much higher um, during during. Uh, high temperatures, uh, uh, low water conditions. It, it really, really, really stresses the, uh, the, uh, the fish. High water on lakes and reservoirs can be a whole bunch of fun. Some of the very best bluegill fishing I've, I've ever done is on the, um, uh, down at Lake Monroe on the Fairfax parking lot. Yeah, the actual parking lot the pavement um, this was a number of years ago the lake was I don't know 10 12 feet high 14 feet high it was it was very near the uh, the spillway and the parking lot at Fairfax was was completely submerged and f bluegill were actually spawning on the parking lot this was I think in June they were spawning and uh, after the spawn, you could go down there and just wade the pavement <laughs> and, and, and target the bluegill. And it, it, it was wonderful. The little grass medians between the parking lots, um, that's where the, the, uh, uh, the fish were holding. And you could just, just work you know, on, along the edge of the parking lot. It's just so bizarre to even say that. But, um, yeah, uh, fish will get up into uh, the, the shallow waters, which were at one time land, and and just hang out. I mean, there's, there's food up in there, uh, uh, obviously a whole bunch of terrestrials, and they take full advantage of that. You just have to be safe. Uh, a canoe, a kayak is probably the, the best way to explore those areas. I can remember uh, paddling through the picnic shelters down at uh, Cutright. Uh, great fun. Power boats, you have to be careful because, again, there's stuff underwater that you may not know about. And uh, it, it, it can be, be damaging. Okay, so that pretty much wraps up finding fish. Uh, short lecture, we will go on to uh, even more safety issues in the next video. If you have questions, comments, um, please leave them below. Remember that we're taking attendance by your, your, your comments on, on the videos. So, check back soon and we will finish up Unit 3, the last lecture, with 
more safety issues of fishing.